welcome back to another episode of Stuff I Learned in the House of Bamboo. Let's talk about stress. Health is important. On Earth, we have an organization dedicated to health called the World Health Organization. It claims in the 21st century, humans are facing an epidemic. It's not cigarettes, it's not Ebola, it's not pedophiles. Although it might be. It's stress. Stress, you say? But Josh, what do you mean? Well, I'll explain. This is you happy. This is you stressed. This is you stressed for a long time. <coughs> Maybe you should think twice before choosing a stressful job. He chose poorly. Yes, he did, Sir Knight. In the modern day, the world is changing fast, and we're having to adapt with it, which can be stressful. At the center of all of this is the brain, perceiving the world and determining how we should respond. If the environment changes, then adapting to this is an active process, involving countless neurological and hormonal changes. These internal shifts all happen with one goal in mind, keeping you alive. Maintaining our internal balance is known as homeostasis. We're a warm-blooded mammal living on land, walking a tightrope in terms of what we need to balance for survival. We have to maintain our body temperature, fluid balance, pH, oxygen levels, and the list goes on. Drop the ball on just one of these things, and whoops, that's it for you. This all requires energy, so we need to be able to move to source that too. Oh great, the world's changing. It's hot, it's cold, there's loads of food, there's no food. That's a problem for homeostasis. Stasis means stand still, but in the real world, nothing stands still, so neither can our internal balance. We are an open system of flowing energy and matter whose wants and needs are constantly changing. So, what do we call the things in the world that impact our internal state? Hans Selye borrowed the word stress from the world of physics and used it for biology, the non-specific response of the body to any demand. Then some dude called John Wayne Mason said, Hans, what about the psychological factors? so it got changed a bit to include those two. There's two parts to stress, the stressor and the response. Maybe the stressor is physical. You work out, you sweat, you're cold, you shiver. Someone's chasing you with a hypodermic needle, you move away. Or maybe the stressor is psychological. You have an exam, you're nervous. Your friends call you fat, you're angry. You don't have any friends, you're lonely. The solutions to the physical stresses seem fairly obvious, but the solutions to the psychological stresses? Jesus, good luck with that. Welcome to the complex world of the highly social Homo sapien, the anxious ape. Listen up, people! I have anxiety! And no wonder. Life is hard. Maybe your behavior helps you. You maintain a good diet, regularly exercise, and go to bed on time. Or maybe you exacerbate the stresses by smoking, drinking, or engaging in risky activities. This seems like a good enough reason to not stress out teenagers with their undeveloped brains. Of course they're going to choose spliffs and beer over a quinoa salad. So how does your body respond to stress? Well, your parasympathetic nervous system that was concentrating on maintaining your body and regenerating certain organs switches to the sympathetic nervous system, which is all about fight or flight, your body's own built-in Red Bull. In the brain, stress sets off a chain reaction called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This releases a bunch of hormones, including glucocorticoids that help you metabolize energy from different stores throughout the body. Here's where it gets interesting. This response is designed to ready you for action. If you're getting chased by a saber-toothed tiger, you want to be a little stressed. This gives you an edge that could save your life. But in the modern day, we've got Jeff who's working 60 hours a week in an office, is getting divorced, and has just found a lump on his left testicle. Now, the acute stress that switches on, keeps you alive, then switches off, has turned into chronic stress, and chronic stress will kill you. Sorry, Jeff. If the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and the sympathetic nervous system remain activated, we reach a point of overload. Depending on the individual, this can be experienced in a number of ways hypertension, depression, insomnia, hair loss, etc. To say I'm stressed is fairly commonplace in society. It's just sort of accepted. But stress can physically change your brain and being. That's scary. Glucocorticoids act on your hippocampus during chronic stress, causing its neurons to lose dendrites, so it physically shrinks. This is plasticity, not damage, but it will still impair your memory. 
chronic stress also alters the neurons of the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. Neurons in the basolateral amygdala expand their dendritic tree, making you more reactive and anxious. Neurons in the medial prefrontal cortex lose branches, making you less reflective. This means you're now less able to think your way out of the situation which is making you stressed, and are more likely to just go through the motions. It's a vicious feedback loop that can impact your mental health. A number of mood disorders related to anxiety and depression show an increase in amygdala size and activity and a reduction in prefrontal cortex and hippocampal volume. Weirdly, most of that information was acquired through testing male rats. Females respond differently to chronic stress. Their hippocampus doesn't shrink. Whilst the memory of male rats is impacted by chronic stress, the females is not. Men and women display different neural patterns when solving the same tasks. They also have a different hormonal makeup. It therefore seems logical that they both use different methods of dealing with issues in day-to-day -day life. Stressful tail shocks can be used to condition male rats, but don't work on females. Give the rats control over the shocks and the stress response disappears completely, for both sexes. That's interesting. So control plays a big role in our experience of stress. This is probably where our obsession with free will stems from. We don't mind getting shocked as long as we're the ones responsible for the shocking. In one experiment, rats were trained to drive tiny cars. This ability to control one aspect of their environment led to a dramatic decrease in stress levels. The effects of chronic stress can be felt right down to the level of our genetic code. Even if you fully recover from a period of sustained stress, the expression levels of a number of your genes will be altered. This enters the world of epigenetics. Your experience with the world has a direct link to how your genetic code is activated. Maybe after recovering from a stressful period, you'll be less stressed by difficult situations in the future. Or maybe you'll have a panic attack. It's partially down to the individual's nature and their nurture. Early life events play a powerful role in our future mental and physical well-being. If you stress out a pregnant rat, her offspring will show impaired hippocampal development. If you stress out an adolescent rat, the same thing happens. If long-term maternal anxiety is displayed by a macaque, her baby will likely develop chronic anxiety. Look at our prison systems. Figures from the National Institute of Justice show abuse or neglect in childhood raises the chances of juvenile arrest by 59%. You can get dealt a bad hand in life when it comes to stress, but what about the stuff you can control? How can you make stress work for you? There is such a thing as good stress. In fact, stress is what makes the world interesting. It's why we love sports, it's challenging yourself, it's games, it's play. We want some unpredictability, but we want it bounded within order. We want rules. Challenging yourself within a set of rules is how we have fun, learn, and gain confidence. Play chess, do a triathlon, make YouTube videos. Ensure your life contains at least some unpredictability. This will better equip you to deal with situations that are out of your control in the future. A recent coping mechanism we've developed for stress is popping prescribed pills. Pharmacological agents are useful in many cases to redress chemical imbalances, but risk disrupting other chemical balances. Drugs don't have side effects, they just have effects. So be careful before getting on a limitless pill to fix all your problems. It might cause some. Meditation may help with psychological stress. I personally don't do it because I have the mindset of the dog from up. But if overthinking got us into this mess, maybe meditation can help break the cycle and get us out. One method of stress management I am familiar with is physical activity. One-off physical exercise improves prefrontal cortex blood flow and enhances executive function. A common cure for writer's block is simply going for a walk. If you regularly exercise, your hippocampus will increase in volume. Fit people generally have a larger hippocampus than slothful people. It's been proven that exercise is an effective antidepressant and protects you against a number of diseases, including cardiovascular disease, dementia, and diabetes. There are countless examples of people struggling with mental health problems, managing their demons through regular exercise. Positive social interactions can also mitigate the effects of chronic stress. If you find yourself in a slump, one of the best things you can do is join some form of community that exercises together regularly, whether playing five-a-side football, distance running with a group, or doing a yoga class. Your brain will be positively impacted in the long run. Anyway, I'm off to do some pull-ups and Skype my mum. Screw you, chronic stress. Let's have a positive social interaction. Mom?